Well, welcome everyone to Visionary Women and the Women in Power series. Today, we are so grateful and honored to have the privilege of spotlighting Dr. Sharon Nazarian, Senior Vice President of the Anti-Defamation League and Head of its International Affairs. Welcome, Dr. Sharon Nazarian. For those of you just tuning into our program and joining us for the first time, Visionary Women is a unique nonprofit community. We fund high impact initiatives for girls, both locally and globally. We've given to over 105 organizations since our inception and have raised over $2 million for these programs. We are both a learning circle and a giving circle, and we use our spotlight and our power to shine a platform and a spotlight on inspiring women leaders who are creating change in the world today. Again, welcome Dr. Sharon Nazarian, and thank you for being here and sharing your time and insights with us. My, my pleasure, Pierre. It's really wonderful to be with all of you here, and especially a big thanks to Angela Nazari, my sister-in-law, uh, one of the founding members of Visionary Women, to Lily Bossy, who I see is with us. My mom, Soraya Nazarian, is here, and as well, Marcella, uh, to follow her in this Spotlight program. Really, it's really, truly an honor for me. Thank you for having me. And also a thank you to Sinai Temple in Los Angeles and the Beverly Hills Courier for joining us and supporting this program today. So again, welcome and thank you everyone. I like to start with a quote. Um, this is a quote from President Joe Biden, 46th president of the United States regarding this topic this morning. He says, we must confront anti-Semitism wherever it occurs. We must continue our work to defeat the stubborn evil of anti-Semitism. This still infects too much of our world, the pernicious lies that surface time and again, including here in our own country. We have to speak out every time anti-Semitism rears its ugly head, regardless of when, where, and, and where it happens. The reason, indifference is silence and silence is consent. So I wanted to set that tone today. Uh, Dr. Sharon Nazarian, you have a very special, unique and powerful role in the world in this fight against anti-Semitism globally. Um, and you're a champion for peace and a global advocate for education, tolerance, equity. Um, I'd like to get to know you a little bit better and share your story with us. Um, but first, can you share a little bit about the Anti-Defamation League and your role as Senior Vice President of International Affairs? Absolutely, Pierre. And again, such a pleasure to be with all of you here this morning. Um, ADL was founded in 1913, um, really at a moment um, which came out of a very specific incident. Um, there was an owner of a pencil factory down south. Uh, Unfortunately, there was a murder that took place in the factory one evening and the finger was pointed of a, of a young white woman who was actually killed, raped and killed. And the finger was quickly pointed to the Jewish owner of the factory. Uh, the owner was put on trial and um, he was found guilty of the murder with very little evidence, very little evidence at that time. This is 1913. And while he was in jail awaiting um, his final verdict, a mob attacked the cell where he was held, pulled him out and actually lynched him and killed him right on the spot. That incident led to the formation of the Anti-Defamation League in 1913. And from the very beginning, the founders of ADL understood that the mission had to be not only to fight against the defamation um, of the Jewish people, but also to secure just and fair treatment for all. So from 1913, um, our founders understood that anti-Semitism only fought alone without understanding other hatreds, other bigotry, other discrimination in society will not end anti-Semitism. So for over 108 years, ADL has become the gold standard in the fight against um, anti-Semitism in the US. We have about 25 offices in all the major cities in the US, including here in Los Angeles. A very strong office has been here over four decades. 
And also, um, we understood that the issues we're fighting against here are not unique to American borders. So we are a global organization because we understand that hate, radicalization, extremism are issues that are truly global. So my job at ADL as Senior Vice President for International is being responsible for all of ADL's work outside the borders of the US. So my team is responsible for Europe, Latin America, Middle East, Africa, and a little bit of Asia. And we bring the same advocacy, the same issue areas, the same tools that we use in the US in partnership um, with communities outside the US around the world. We bring the same advocacy to governments. So a lot of my work, essentially, I'm kind of known as the foreign minister of ADL. So I engage with foreign governments. I engage with their ministries of education, the ministries of interior when it comes to safety and security of vulnerable communities. And we also do programmatic work. And so my unit is seen essentially as the export arm of the ADL. Whatever know-how, whatever skill sets, whatever products that we have that we know are true and tested and effective, I bring it to Europe, to Latin America, and try to use the same expertise to adapt it to those societies. We have to understand that America is different um, and each country has its own context, but we adapt, we acculturate, and we try to put those same skill sets and expertise to um, the benefit and support of other communities around the world. I can tell you that Marcella and, and, and I worked closely together when ADL was asked by the Mexican foreign ministry, it's a little example of what we do, when in the last presidential elections, not this one, the last one in 2016, there was a real heightened uh, level of extremism and attacks against Mexican nationals in the US. Language was used that was very um, humiliating, dehumanizing. And so the foreign minister of Mexico came to ADL and asked our CEO, where we signed an MOU with the foreign ministry to deliver thousands of training workshops to consular staff, including Marcella herself and her staff, about what is extremism, what is um, a hate crime, what, it, what substantiates a hate crime, because at that time, many in the, uh, in the Mexican national community were afraid to go to the police because of immigration issues. There's so much complexity and so much emotion and fear mm -hmm. there. So they were coming to the consulates in uh, Mexican consulates in American cities asking for protection when they uh, experienced hate crimes. So we had a, now a long standing partnership with the Mexican foreign ministry and Marcela was very instrumental in that, um, in helping um, their nationals in the US who are experiencing hate crimes and ADL really trained the consular staff about um, uh, um, all forms of discrimination, hate, and, and bigotry that shows up in our city. So that's a little bit about ADL and how we function. I, I'm happy to answer more questions in detail later. Thank you for that. And um, would you also share, I think it's very important for others to understand how you were inspired to take on this role. I know you joined ADL in 2017, and um, it's, such, it's such an enormous task uh really to 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 attack this globally everything that's involved i would really love for our viewers to get to know you personally and you better the woman behind the fight thank you thank you Pierre. Yeah, absolutely you know we all have unique journeys and mine mine was interesting too that brought me to adl you know i was born in tehran iran um, to a Jewish family that, you know, Jews have been in Iran for over 2,700 years. We're one of the oldest Jewish communities in the world, we like to think. Iranian Jews, you know, we're neither Ashkenazi, we're not Sephardic, for those of you who are familiar with those terms. We're not of European descent, and we're not of Spanish descent. Jews have been in Iran, you know, since the Babylonian times, so we have a very long, rich history. And the history of Jews in Iran has been a checkered one. We've gone through periods where there's been tolerance, and really room for a minority to grow and flourish. And we've had periods of real severe pogroms and severe discrimination. And by the time my father was born in 19, uh, 1913, um, Jews were living in literal ghettos, legal ghettos in Tehran and other major cities. So during my father's lifetime, and thank God today he's 90 and, and you know still with us, um, Iranian Jews experienced until the 1978 revolution a period of real um, growth and not only legal protection as religious minorities, 
but the ability to integrate into Iranian society. And that was my experience as a child. So I, I went to a Jewish day school and my family, um, my father was a businessman. While there was still very specific institutional um, discrimination against minorities like Jews and Baha'is and others, we felt that as Iran modernized and opened, um, Jews also were able to flourish. That's of course up until 1979 when the revolution happened. And my family, like many, many Jews, Jewish families and other minority families understood that the coming revolution, which was very quickly hijacked from a democracy revolution to become an Islamist uh, revolution meant that we could no longer feel safe. My father and parents both decided that we had to leave our home and um, immigrate to Israel where my grandmother lived, <laughs> excuse me. And we were lucky enough to think that, you know, not only we had a home in Israel, but it was close enough to think if the revolution won't stick, we can always come back and feel safe again. Sadly, very quickly, we realized that um, the consolidation of the Islamic regime that took over Iran was not going to give way for a return back to whether it was a monarchy or any sort of democracy, which we hoped for. And my parents made a decision to emigrate to the US because at that time, Israel, in terms of its economy, it was still more socialist bent. And my father as an entrepreneur felt that really the US would be a better place for him to restart. You know, he had four children, really starting from scratch in the US. So we emigrated to Los Angeles in 1979. At that point, really, my parents did what many, many uh, immigrants do, set down roots, find places for her children to uh, get education, to feel, have a sense of belonging, to create community. And we did that in Beverly Hills. We were lucky enough that this country truly opened its arms to us. And my parents always have raised us with the notion how, how blessed we are that we came to America and that the U.S. was, was a country that embraced us in such warm and, and uh, opportunistic ways that my father could really reestablish himself. My mom could feel that she could raise her children with safety and peace. And so we all flourished. Four children grew up. We went through our work. I went on and did my PhD at USC. Um, I was a I'm a political economist. So my work was really about understanding uh, different economies around the world. And I started teaching at UCLA. Um, and very quickly, I realized that what was happening on US campuses when it came to issues around Israel, there was a narrative shift where Israel had been seen as a weak country, a small weak country among the sea of neighbors who really were hostile. Um, there was a shift in the narrative where then Israel was seen then as kind of the Goliath, as the military power. And the narrative around how Israel was being seen shifted. So one of the first things I did was really establish a Center for Israel Studies at UCLA UCLA is a public university, you're all familiar with it. And our solution was really about education. We knew that we need to make long-term investments in the understanding of, of Israel as a Jewish and democratic state and so on. So the second chapter of my work after my, after my education was really about philanthropy. I established our family foundation very closely working with my mom and my dad and my siblings, all of us together. Um, the second bucket of my work was really about education and my teaching that I did at UCLA and the center. And the final bucket of my work was around foreign policy. I was very interested in our country's relation with many um, countries around the world and understanding where are we um, as, a, as a real a beacon. I really see the U.S. as a beacon um, and, and where we have to lead with our democratic ideals, and so I did a lot of um, fact-finding missions to countries like, you know, beginning in Cuba, but then going to Afghanistan, going to Iraq, going to North Korea, which was really an exceptional experience for me, um, going to South Sudan that had just been established as an independent country, and understanding, looking at U.S. policy toward those countries and how can we do better. So those were my three buckets. And really, as we all know, life brings you things that you just would never predict. ADL came into my life in a very you know, unpredictable way. Um, I was honored by the local ADL chapter in Los Angeles. Um, and then very quickly, the CEO, um, Jonathan Greenblatt, who I knew from the White House, he worked in the Obama White House, came to me and said, I need someone to lead all our international work. And I said, Jonathan, you know, I haven't really done much work on anti-Semitism. 
He said, Sharon, you have exactly the profile I need. You are someone, first and foremost, who comes from a community in Iran who understood what it means to feel anti-Semitism every day. And that's your job. Your job, your responsibility is to look to all the communities around the world and see what are their needs on day to day in terms of Jewish life. And secondly, you have your academic background. That's very important to me. And thirdly, it's your foreign policy work. So just really out of nowhere, I accept <laughs> very big post, uh, Fiera, that um, I was unsure if I'm the right person. But four years later, it was probably the biggest gift I've gotten because I've learned, I've grown. And to be at the helm of one of the most premier organizations in Jewish community today, it's a true privilege. So I'm really lucky mm -hmm. to be in today. And that's my journey. And as a woman being, you know, as a woman, what are some of the, the, the benefits and challenges of being a woman in this role? Because it's such an enormous task. And I know that internationally, you know, women, some women are celebrated and some have to go through other channels to get their work done. What is your experience? There, I can tell you that I've had both. I've had experiences where my voice as a woman is truly celebrated. And I can tell you at ADL, the fact that I sit on a senior executive team of ADL, I'm a senior vice president, and I directly report to the CEO has been really celebrated. I can hear from my colleagues in, in the agency up and down their hierarchy that they look to me and that having a role model and having someone like myself as a woman, as a Middle Eastern woman, um, and all that I bring to my daily work um, is really, really commended. I can also tell you through my travels when I'm in Afghanistan, I was in Tunisia and other countries that are more conservative. You know, I'm given the seat on the corner. I'm not asked to sit at the, you know, the main table. My views are not asked, you know, readily and I have to kind of push in. I think all of your listeners are familiar with these um, mm -hmm. bad, you know, realities of our society that still persist today. And, and I'm someone who was raised by a mom who has been a role model to me. She has given me the confidence to know no matter where I'm sitting, my voice will be heard. And that came very young to me. I, I made sure I sat at the boardroom table. I made sure I had a seat and I made sure that I always spoke up. So the fact that I was raised with enough self-confidence um, and security to do that enables me today, no matter which culture I'm in, no matter what country I'm in, to understand the cultural context, I'm not insensitive to that. I think we have to go into those situations, not just with our American head. And I think my Iranianness enables me to be sensitive, but at the same time, not let that dictate who I am. So when I went to Saudi Arabia, you know, the rules of the country is you have to cover your head. And you can imagine as someone, as a Jewish woman who fled an Islamist revolution in my country and I was forced to leave, the hijab is a symbol of oppression to me. And when it's, when, it's, when it's imposed, when women choose for themselves, of course, it is an act of faith and it's an act of modesty that I respect when it's chosen. But when it's imposed, like the government of Iran does today on its women citizens, that to me feels an act of oppression. So when I went to Saudi Arabia, I... For, for, before every meeting that I had with ministers and even with the, with the uh, crown prince, I said that as an, as an American woman, I will not be covering my head and I didn't. So I think we have to look at the context that we're in. We have to um, really understand what our goal is and what the messages we wanna give. And that's what diplomacy is really about. And that's, that's a lot of my work is about that. And as a woman, it comes into every, every day, every decision that I make. Well, we here at Visionary Women honor and celebrate you, Sharon, and we are so proud of the work that you're doing. I want to get into straight into the the, the roots of the conversation, which really is uh, coming to an understanding of what anti-Semitism is. I know there's a lot of definitions floating around, and I've done research, and there's, I believe, an IRA definition, and the ADL has a definition. And we all have experienced um, or have an understanding of our own in one way or another. So I want to ask you about that. Also, you know, just, just something that I wanted to note is that there is a rise of this awareness in the world today of anti-Semitism, but there's still so many young people that have never even heard the word, you know? And so I wanted to just take this, this moment, if you could encapsulate it. Uh, for us in a digestible manner for those who might just be tuning in for the first time or 
dropping in and out, you know. Um, could you could you share how you define it? Sure, and I think um, one of the uh, uh, reflections of what ADL is is that we are a very nuanced and thoughtful organization. So to think that one um, definition, you know, one sentence, Webster's dictionary captures anti-Semitism, I think, would be too limiting. What we do talk about is um, hatred of the Jewish people that encompasses um, not only the very identity of, of Jews. Um, using um, millennial old tropes that have defined and, and were meant to um, other Jews, um, whether it's as citizens of their country or um, as with characteristics and stereotypes that um, leads to the hatred of, of the Jewish people. This definition has to continually be, be updated because you know, what we're experiencing today is that new manifestations of, of the definition that cannot just be captured in a two sentence line. So your mm -hmm. reference the IRA definition, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. This was a definition really started at the European uh, Euro Union level. It was um, drafted and written by European governments and civil society organizations. And what was really beneficial about it is again, exactly that updating that I mentioned. The definition itself, again, there are many who will criticize the actual definition. What is helpful about the IRA, I-H-R-A definition, and you're welcome to look it up, is it cites contemporary examples of what would be considered anti-Semitic today. So it was created and drafted as an education tool, as a as a training tool, whether it's for law enforcement, it's for judges, it's for university administrators. So when there's a doubt, you go to those examples and you say, is the Jewish community or the Jewish student or the Jewish uh, club being held to a different standard? Are characterizations being made that this entity, Jewish, again, individual or Jewish entity is being vilified because of their faith or because of their um, connection with Israel, for example. So the IRA definition was very unique in that it added examples of when the delegitimization of Israel, not criticism of Israeli policy, but the delegitimization of Israel as a state steps over the line into anti-Semitism. So when you say that the Jewish people are the only people in the world to have no right to self-determination in a country of their own called Israel, if that's your line, no other people, but only the Jewish people have no right. That is anti-Semitic. So the IRA definition clearly states out in examples, if you hold Israel to a standard that you hold no other country to, that's anti-Semitic. So this is the updated definition, uh, Piera, and that's why the IRA definition is helpful. I think there's mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of confusion, a lack of knowledge, as you said about anti-Semitic. Yes. And it can be tricky. And yeah. I think we ask a lot of our brethren in our, in our countries to really understand it. And it gets, uh, it gets sensitive sometimes as do other minority groups with their own sensitivities. So mm -hmm. we have to educate as much as we can. We have to draw some clear lines and know that some of it is fuzzy and, and more challenging. And therefore we at ADL, for example, use the term anti-Semitic very carefully, very carefully. And in fact, when those in our society who want to kind of take on a battle and really yell and scream an incident, and they call it and label it anti-Semitic when it's really not, we call that out because that diminishes the term, that diminishes the power when an instant incident or situation is actually clearly anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. We at ADL are very mindful and very careful about how we use that term, how do we use that label, and even with people, we don't say that's an anti-Semite. Very clearly do we do that. We say that person holds anti-Semitic views. And therefore, we always leave the door open for that person, the ability to be educated and to be you know, made to understand why something they said or something they did was deemed you know, an anti-Semitic act. I want to uh, read two quotes highlighting the fact that anti-Semitism unchecked is not only a threat to Jewish people, but to all people, because really what we're talking about here is a humanitarian issue. No people group is above another people group. This is really the big point in the big picture. There's so much racism in the world today, and there's so much intolerance and defamation, but what we really want to focus 
on is the fact that we can bridge this divide. It does require a lot of work, education. There are some key elements, you know, core belief systems come into play, cultural, um, cultural conditioning can come into play, lack of education, um, even the power of words, which you are so gracious and uh, to address that it's very important how we choose our words and what we say, because they have power and they have meaning. So I want to read this quote by Samantha Power. She's the former U.S. ambassador to the United Nations. And she said, rising anti-Semitism is rarely the lone or last expression of intolerance in a society. And I really want that to sink into our viewers because we're not just talking about hate against one people group. This really, you know, embedded deep into the roots of societies and cultures across the world can turn on anyone at any time uh, for your religious beliefs, for your political beliefs, for your race, for anything. So, so really it's a, a root issue of how we look at other human beings. Also, I love quoting Martin Luther King. He says, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And, um, and on this topic of core belief systems, we do see these stereotypes building across the spectrum in all areas of life. And I was reading an article um, addressing in the New York Times an, an op-ed. Um, I actually have the, the reference, David Brooks, an op-ed columnist for the New York Times. He's a commentator for PBS NewsHour and NPR's All Things Considered and NBC's Meet the Press. He wrote an article uh, explaining an extremist mindset and what it means to have anti-pluralistic beliefs. And I do just want to read this and get your re response, Sharon, if you agree, if you've experienced this, if you agree. But he says that extremist mindset thinking is, there's first the promotion of black and white thinking and uh, groups work to, divide, to define an opposition between us and them. So it's really black and white, us versus them. And then it's linked with the second element, which is a feeling of superiority. So anytime anyone thinks it's either this or that, and then on top of it, I am better than you for any reason, for anyone to have this thought. And then finally, extremist groups engage in a process of dehumanization. They give their opposing groups animalistic characteristics like labeling immigrants. I'm not even gonna use the language in here. This reinforces the us versus them and also legitimizes violent actions. Does this align what you've seen in your work for the extremist mindset? Is there anything that you would want to add or, or uh, say about this? Yeah, Peter, I think I want to first address the, the initial point that you raised um, about antisemitism. And we say that antisemitism is a canary in the coal mine. So when we look at liberal societies, democratic societies today, one of the first indicators of democratic backsliding, which means that those societies are moving not only toward further um, investment in their democratic institutions, but actually moving back towards repression, towards a uh, lack of democracy, is when anti-Semitic trends go up. And we have seen that in countries like Hungary, um, you know, especially in Eastern Europe. And we, a lot of my talking points with those governments speaks about anti-Semitism and rising anti-Semitism being a sign uh, of the health of their democracy. So it's about an issue that is not the problem of the Jewish people or the Jewish citizens of your country. It is an actual um, snapshot of your country, its health, and the protection of all of its citizens. So the canary and coal mine metaphor is really serves perfectly because what we have documented and seen throughout history that any society where anti-Semitism is on the rise, other forms of oppression, other forms of discrimination and hate follow suit very quickly. And this has been you know, documented and tested throughout time over and over again. So that's something we can definitely you know, put in place and know that's a reality. And that for all of us to understand when any group is oppressed, the other um, groups can never afford to say it's only their problem. It is by the whole of society challenge that we face. And that's why in America today, we have to really look at the mirror and say, what is going on? Not only in the polarization that we're feeling um, uh, take place in our society where the political center has essentially evaporated 
And again, this is a global pattern. This is not just the US, but with the polarization uh, of our political discourse and people being forced to choose either the extreme left or the extreme right. The other ring that you were mentioning, the idea of kind of this white supremacy, whether it's that ideology or any ideology that looks at that binary nature of society, either you're with us or you're not, either you're white or you're black, all these false, um, false dichotomies of society only lead in to those extremist views. What we've seen in America, and I would say truly around the globe, is the mainstreaming of ideas by Iran who've always been there. These extremist notions, whether they're on the right or on the left or whatever, doesn't matter ideologically where they've come, they're not new. What is worrisome to all of us, and we feel it and we see it, is that those taboo ideas have now entered our political discourse and are feeling more and more mainstream every day. Mm -hmm. And that's the challenge of our society. When you talk about pluralism, um, we talk about the, the new terms that we're all using, our inter intersectional identity. Each of us as individuals, I'm a woman, I'm a Middle Easterner, I'm a Jewish person, I'm an academic, I fight anti-Semitism. We all expect for all our identities to be encapsulated in the way we're treated by society. Not one or the other, not the color of our skin only, not only our gender, none of it. So we have to demand from society to look at us in our wholeness and our totality. Mm -hmm. And some of the extremist views that you cited, uh, Pira, really point their finger on one aspect of anyone's identity and using that to other, to say mm -hmm. you're not. So a lot of what we see in the current manifestation, especially on the white supremacist side, is this fear and anxiety that we've seen even in the last election and we, even with kind of the uh, Trump effect that we saw in America, was the feeling by the white majority in, in this country that they are being replaced. And there's a literal theory called the white replacement theory. It is a you know, white supremacist ideology where they feel that the country of the United States that belong to them is taken away by minority groups, that multiculturalism and this diversity that everyone's been you know, espousing is one aimed at and specifically targeted to take power away from the white majority in the US. And who is doing that? It's the Jews. Who's pushing multiculturalism? It's the Jews. So you see very quickly the dots connected in this mm -hmm. kind of very <clears throat> ideology from how they feel and how their sentiment as citizens of this country um, is then put into play about who is the, doing this to them and what is the goal. And that's why you see these, you know, again, it's not just anti-Semitic, of course it's anti, it's anti-Black, it's anti-Latino, it's anti-LGBT, but it's about this fear of feeling replaced and all the power taken away from them. And therefore they are now the vulnerable group and they are the victims. So that's where that ideology comes from. It's kind of mm -hmm. <laughs> unfortunately emboldened um, um, in the last administration by some of the messaging, some of the signaling that came from different parts of the government. And also, you know, with new entities like QAnon, which are purely built on conspiracy theories. So when you have, you know, messaging from the top built on mm -hmm. theories, what do you expect your citizens, you know, to, to feel? What is the messaging to our citizens? So Kiranon is a, is a very loose fit um, ideology, if you can call it that, that purely is built on various conspiracy theories about what's happening in society, what are the powers in the shadows of our, of our society controlling America, its government? And so the pervasiveness of, of conspiracy theory we saw around COVID, you know, blaming different minority groups for it. I mean, all of this mentality is really kind of comes at this, the polarization, the lack of center, and the fear and anxiety that many citizens feel today. And the antidote, as you mentioned, is embracing that we have intersectional personalities. Um, the term that I found was um, pluralism. And I just want to read what it is so people understand. It is a belief that each person is a symphony of identities and that no one is reducible to a single label. I think this is so important because hate usually is very reductive, the language, the ideas. It's when you take a very complex, beautiful, human being and you try to reduce them 
to something like a, a sound bite, something really small that you can abuse, that you can just, you know, I mean, it's really, it's really, um, it's, it's really a horrible thing. This is where the dehumanization comes in. You know, each person, each single one of us, we may have different backgrounds, we may have different faiths, we might have different political affiliations or ideologies, but at the end of the day, we're all human beings and we all deserve dignity, respect, and we should be able to celebrate each other's differences without dehumanizing one another. So one of the things that I wanna talk about are solutions because that we have there's big problems and this is what your life is dedicated to is, is the solutions. Um, you know, I know that that your work, you're going around the world and you're speaking to uh, all these global affairs councils and governments and people groups, but can you tell us what the approach is or what the methodologies are to create change? Really, because I know this, we're dealing with indoctrination and there has to be some sort of reversal. How do we, how do we, what can we do or how, how, how do you approach something like this? The metaphor I like to use is about being in a room with a huge elephant in the dark and each of us touching a piece of it and feeling like, oh, I understand what this is, but you only have one piece of it. And then coming at it from a different angle. Oh, I understand. So if we're all blind, we're in a big room, there's an elephant in there and we only can you know, touch the piece that we know. So we have to take a whole of society um, view here. And it starts with the diagnosis. We have to understand where are we today um, in our current manifestation in our societies. And we have to look at the big factors. You know, what, what role is globalization playing? What role is social media playing? I and mean, we haven't really touched on that, Piera. And that's, that's a huge factor. And I think on the solutions, we have to go there. Um, what role is our current education system and the way we're educating our next generations? Um, how are we doing there? Um, what role is the economic anxieties that face our society? You know, COVID was really an unprecedented experience for the globe, right? This is an experience we all shared, didn't know borders, didn't know boundaries. And the economic anxieties that came with it led to a lot of really extreme ideas and extreme viewpoints. So we have to see what happens when societies are under stress. Why does xenophobia become one of the first things that goes up? The you know, fear of the other, fear of um, those who are different from you. So the diagnosis is very important and we have to really be accurate. And as civil society organizations like us, we have to make sure it's not politicized. That is one of the big, big challenges that we've experienced in our society, even anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism became a political football in the last four or five years, where one party says, we're good at it, and the other party says, you're too weak at it. That doesn't help any fight. As long as we come to these issues, again, on the diagnosis side, knowing that this has to be a whole of society, we cannot afford for these to be viewed through partisan lenses. And it takes all of us. So when it comes to our government, it has to be bipartisan. And the minute one party says we have control over it, that's a really bad sign. So that's the diagnosis, Piera. On the solution side, we at ADL have made several big bets. And we are a part and a piece of the whole solution that, uh, that we have to have an ecosystem of solutions. No one entity can have a silver bullet. We know that. This is big. And as I mentioned, the core foundational issues and challenges facing our societies today. So no one entity even government can fix it all. So it takes all of us. The big bets we've made, and I want to point to technology a little bit now, is that in 2017, ADL was the first civil rights organization to establish a center on technology and society in the Silicon Valley on the ground. So we were the first to understand that for us to really push back against the huge trends in online hate, and we were the first ones to be documenting it and measuring it. We had to work with all the platforms, social media platform companies to work on the solution. We literally had an engineering lab where we, for the first time, brought together Facebook, Google, and all of the main players. They would not talk to each other before then. We brought them together and said, we need wow. to sit here right now, look at AI, artificial intelligence, look at machine learning, Look at you know, alternative messaging online. 
what are the solutions where we can really not only deflect, but also educate. And we all know, you know, the role of Facebook today. It's not, it's not, the diagnosis is there, but we have to look for solutions that are permanent, consistent, and really evolving with the new threats that are coming. This is a very dynamic space and a challenging one. So we know, for example, we pushed Facebook um, for, at ADL where we did a campaign called Stop Hate for Profit, where for a month we got the 1,000 largest uh, private uh, companies around the board, the biggest brands, you know, Nike, all, all the biggest brands, a thousand of them, to take a one month um, pause on purchasing ads from Facebook. He said, you know what? We had to hit the bottom line. And that's where we went. He said for a month, and this was a hugely successful campaign for the first time ever. As a result, Facebook took some very concrete steps we had asked them to do. Number one, change their terms of use on Holocaust denial. The fact that misinformation, and now post COVID, we know the dangers of misinformation. But at that time, this was before COVID, we got them to address specifically misinformation online about the Holocaust. So that is now against the terms of use of Facebook. Number two, we got them to actually hire a VP specifically looking at online hate and how do you create new policies and new solutions. So one person all day long, that's all they have to be thinking about. There's a lot more to do, Pierre. I mean, the social media companies are still dragging their feet. They're still reluctant. And we have to keep the pressure on. So that's part of one part of the solution that we can keep our eye off. But we also have to think about how technology can be a provider of assistance, not just a threat. Those of you in the tech sector, you know that we have innovation capabilities now that really can be on the forefront of not only keeping our children safe on TikTok. All of you know that you know children at a younger and younger age are getting exposed to hate language hate ideology in a way that parents can't control anymore. I mean, TikTok is, is a really challenging platform because it's geared towards nine, 10, 11 year olds. Mm -hmm. How do you inoculate young, young little girls and boys against you know, what, what you're seeing? The other, the other sector that's really problematic is the gaming, gaming sector. You know, the young boys are specifically targeted for radicalization. We have evidence. I actually testified before a congressional committee on this. So the gaming sectors in all our children are participating in, we've seen is become a recruiting platform for white supremacists. And we have evidence that, and we've provided that to our, to our Congress. So this is part of the challenge is the solutions have to fit the problems of this moment and the next year and the next five years. We cannot rest on our laurels that, oh, you know, yes, of course, education, we have a huge education department and we have to do those long-term solutions. No doubt, but we also have to see where the threats are coming from right now. And it feels a bit of whack-a-mole, but we can't afford not to go after. Mm -hmm. So, you know, short-term, it's technology. It's about advocacy, long-term education, education, education. I mean, I just can't stop to think of, talk about that. We have now gone fully digital. We have had over 40, 50 years of educating over a million school children in America. I, my team exports all that to Europe now. So I am really, as I said, um, acting as the export arm, my team and I are. And so we're bringing fully digital um, education products on anti-Semitism, and we're gonna be piloting that in the UK this year in 2021, where we first and foremost are talking about Jewish identity. As you said, most of the challenge is about ignorance, is about not knowing. There are plenty of you know, British adults, youth, who have never met a Jew. So first it's about understanding what is the Jewish identity? What are our cultural um, heritage? Where do we come from? The second is, is a modular um, product, which we're really proud of. The second is about the Jewish immigration story to your country. How did Jews get here, whether to the UK or France or Germany or to the US? And the third module is about contemporary manifestations of antisemitism, how it shows up in your city today. Where are examples of today as we speak, if you're a Palestinian activist and you believe in um, rights for the Palestinians, but you carry a Hamas flag and you go in front of a Jewish owned business in Los Angeles, or God forbid what happened, you know, assault a Jewish person sitting in a sushi restaurant, that is anti-Semitic. 
that is not advocating, you know, for a Palestinian state. We should have every right to do in a nonviolent um, and non-threatening way. So how do we educate our societies and inoculate against manifestations that are today? Not what happened 500 years ago, but today in our, the core of our society. And I wanna ask one more question before we break for questions from the audience, because we will uh, use the remaining time uh, for that. The last question I have for you, Sharon, and thank you um, for, for everything, is how can we bring this conversation home? Because I know that we are always talking about, you know, the world out there. But I, I went to the ADL website, and I know you have a lot of resources. I believe you have something for parents, and you have. I, can you just um, can you just touch on that briefly, and then we'll go to the the Q and A. Our our education colleagues are really tremendous. We have a lot of um, content for parents. We call table talk. It's literally about how do you take these very complex, thorny, challenging concepts break them down for different age groups that you can literally have around your dinner table. And we, you know, it's sad to say, we need to do that as parents today. We need to protect our children in some ways and then also inform them um, at an age appropriate level. Because when they're out there, whether it's in their school or if it's in their camp or whatever they're doing these days, unfortunately, these kinds of issues will enter their lives. So how do we protect them with enough language and enough understanding um, to say, you know, I am who I am, whether I'm wearing a kippah and I, I'm, I'm an observant or visually um, uh, um, a Jewish person, or if I have whatever feelings and beliefs I have, um, the ability of someone to make me feel less than. And again, it has to do the same with the color of your skin or it has to do with your heritage if you're wherever you come from. Nobody should have the power to make our children whoever we are, whatever identity is to feel less than. So that's one of ADL's goals in, in our content that we create. It's not just about anti-Semitism. It's about taking these very kind of fundamental concepts and making it palatable and available to parents to have those kinds of conversations. And also on the, on the side of those who perpetrate these, I mean, children could be bullies and they could use what they're hearing in their society, maybe in home or in their own milieu and bring it to that um, uh, schoolyard or bring it to that baseball uh, practice and you know re reiterate some of that language that could be completely you know you know our children might might just not know how to deal with it so ADL education colleagues are all professionals really take some of these I you know like what is allyship when you see a child being bullied on a school ground what is what are the steps you can take as an ally do you have to break up the fight physically? Not necessarily. Can you go up to that child who has been the victim and afterwards just put your arm around that person? This was pre-COVID um, and say, I'm here for you. I know this wasn't your fault. I, I saw that you got sad. So we create those very specific human um, and um, age appropriate content for parents to speak with their children, to show them how they can show up if they see a victim or if they are the target themselves how to understand it and how to make sure that it doesn't penetrate in a deeply painful way. Thank you. I'm just looking through the chat box. If anyone wants to add a question, please do. I do wanna read a couple uh, comments. Um, we have, what a heartfelt and inspiring conversation. Love my extraordinary visionary sisters. Thank you, Dr. Sharon Nazarian for your humanitarian voice. Um, Sharon inspires us and is a wonderful voice for ADL and all of us. Her clear presentation on anti-Semitism and racism is extraordinary. I couldn't agree more. Um, I don't see a tremendous amount of questions. We have Marcella Solorio. Um, thank you, Sharon, you're great. And indeed you inspire us all. Sharon is the Consul General of Mexico here in Los Angeles. Um, I, I, if there are no, uh, I'll give everyone a moment, but I do have a question that I wanted to bring up earlier. Um, I moved past. I know that ADL has created an incredible tracking and polling system for anti-Semitism online. And I know that uh, it's been going on, am I correct? It's been going on for 40 years. Yes. And, and then since 2016, it's been um, revamped or something like that. Can you tell us how this tool works and how, 
how others might be able to learn from it? So, you know, the first thing when, when I earlier talked about diagnosis, you know, we have to understand that the diagnosis has to be based on data and has to be ba based on solid research. And we are a data-driven organization. You know, we don't just, you know, make assertions that we cannot stand by. Um, I can tell you that we have been, for example, been conducting a lot of opinion surveys um, across time, mostly in the U.S. And then starting in 2014, we did the most comprehensive opinion survey in 101 countries. We call it the Global 100 Survey on Antisemitic Attitudes. And we use that data to not only do our advocacy with the governments, whether it's the US government or all the countries I mentioned, literally 101 countries around the world. And one of my first talking points, which, whichever government I'm meeting with is, I put the data in front of them. You know, here's a global 100 survey results for your country. Here's how your citizens fared when it came to holding anti-Semitic and other um, biased views. And there's, I mean, there's no way you can refute that. So starting with data is very important. Um, and then using that data to guide our policy and programmatic, um, very important for us to do that. And what you referenced in terms of our online index was the first effort and not an easy one, and we're still perfecting it as we speak here, as you referenced, is to really try to measure um, the kind of hate language that we are advocating to the social media companies, to our governments to fight back against. But we have to do that with data. We have to bring evidence of our assertions. And that's what that is. So we use different tools and mechanisms. And I'm telling you, that's not my area of expertise. So I have to don't know exactly the methodology of what we use. But I do know that everything from using algorithms and using all kinds of um, tools that my colleagues, who are all you know, software engineers, have perfected to actually come up with an annual measurement of online hate the way we've defined it, right? It's not gonna be encapsulating everything, but it's the specific determinations and categorization that ADLs develop to measure um, levels of hate that's available online. I think we do a few specific platforms that we monitor, for example, we can't you know, measure everything, um, but our, our um, uh, methodology is very much on our website and you can look into it if you're more technology oriented than I am. Um, and, and we use that as a tool. It is not the be all end all. It is not going to capture everything. But we think having the, uh, the timeline to show from 10 years ago to today, for example, where have been the trends? Where are the, the, the challenges when it comes to online hate? What has been working? What has not been working? So it gives us a real important um, snapshot of changes um, when it comes to radicalization online, when it comes to mainstreaming of some of these ideologies that I said used to be on fringes. So for example, there's a, there's a platform called 8chan or 4chan, there's two of them where a lot of extremists, especially white supremacists use to communicate with one another. We monitor that in our center on extremism. When we see that language shift to a mainstream platform like Facebook, that's telling to us. Because that means that those who hold such views feel you know, um, that the space is being made open for those extremist ideology to become mainstream. So those are the things that our online hate index can really pick up on and therefore allow us to see the trends that we have to then really push back against. So again, technology has a huge role to play here. We have our center has now grown, you know, from 2017, it was basically two people. Now, you know, we're up to a good size staff of, you know, 10, 12 people, all of them software engineers. These are the best of the best in the tech world who we've recruited to really understand the measurement, understand the applicability of tools on the solution side, and to really have evidence-based policy um, advocacy that we can bring to the platforms and to our government. So that's kind of where we are. And we, we're going to continue to lean into that. We know that online, a lot of what happens online doesn't stay online. It comes into our cities. It comes into acts of violence. And sadly, um, you know, it's about radicalization. It's about indoctrination. It's about, you know, conspiracy mindedness that go from offline online into our neighborhoods, into our schools. And therefore, we cannot afford to be passive about it. 
And I want to add to that, there was a question that came in, I'm going to summarize. Um, is there a way to monitor the educational systems internationally and take action against that because it could be through textbooks or a curriculum? Absolutely, absolutely. I have one team member who's a fluent Arabic speaker, for example, and his number one task every year at the beginning of a school year, um, I'll step back for a minute. When we did our Global 100 PRA, the region of the world that held the highest levels of anti-Semitic attitudes was the Middle East. So I think that's not a surprise given the history, given the uh, issues you know, with Israel and the Arab world. So this team member who is a PhD, you know, fluent Arabic speaker, his, one of his main portfolios is every fall looking at the textbooks of countries like Saudi Arabia, UAE. We did one this year on Iran. We did on Hezbollah schools in Lebanon. Um, and um, uh, I, I mentioned UAE already. So textbooks are a very, very powerful indicator of where society is going and where governments are putting their investment in their narrative for their country. And so that is for us a very powerful tool to bring it, for example, into the Hamas in Gaza with UNRWA right now, where the US has now decided to re-engage with the UN refugee agency that's responsible for Gaza and the West Bank. And to say, you're gonna re-engage, great. You're gonna give more resources to UNRWA, the UN agency, great. We want to look at the textbooks that UNRWA schools use to teach Palestinians. And we have shown <coughs> excuse me, that over and over again, there is not only hatred of Jews, not only hatred of Israel, but incitement to violence in some of those textbooks. So this is something that I've spoken with the Biden administration multiple times in the State Department. This is something that we bring up all over. And this is a major point of our advocacy because education and textbooks is truly the best test of what governments, um, their belief system is, what their values are, and what they want to teach the next uh, generation. So I think that's, thank you for bringing that question up here as a very important one. And we at ADL are very invested in being a, you know, real arbitrator in terms of what language is used in textbooks and what does it reflect. And the othering, by the way, when I talk about textbooks, it's not just about anti-Semitism. With Saudi Arabia, it's about treatment of Christians, treatment of non-Muslims, treatment of women, treatment of LGBT. We raise all of that. It is not just about treatment of Jews or depiction of, of Jews and Israel. It's really about any form of hate that shows up in those textbooks. Well, we are close to uh, being on the hour, but Dr. Sharon Azarian, this has been incredibly informative and we are so lucky to have you as a member of our community here and just the opportunity to celebrate you and your work. And you're a champion for all of us. You are a real advocate. You are a real activist. You are a real power woman. And I, um, I'm, just, I'm just so inspired by the work that you're doing. Again, uh, for all of, all of you tuning into Visionary Women, uh, you can learn more about our organization at visionarywomen.com. We are a nonprofit community and we are membership based and we do programs like this all the time. We talk about important issues that are going on in the world where women are champion, championing the change and, um, and we're raising funds. We've, as I mentioned earlier, we've, we've raised over $2 million and have given to over 105 organizations through the fundraising for, from our membership and programming. And uh, I just wanted to, again, chime in and say Visionary Women really embraces diversity, mm -hmm. unity, all, all races, all creeds, all faith. We stand against hate in, of any kind. And um, we're just so, so grateful to be able to um, celebrate our freedom and democracy together. And thank you so much, Dr. Sharon Nazarian, again, for this amazing, incredible program we we are just so grateful for you. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. I can't thank Visionary Women enough. As I mentioned, I really want to commend uh, Angela Nazarian and, and the board of Visionary Women, Kiara, for your work um, and the leadership that you have presented to our community in Los Angeles and beyond. And I'm here anytime, any moment. Please know that I'm a huge, huge supporter of your mission and how important it is. And thank you for all the great work that you all do every single day.
is tremendously important and impactful. So I really uh, celebrate you all. And thank you for having me today. I really appreciate it. Thank you again. Bye everyone. Have a great day.